Friends, it has been nearly 2,000 years since Pentecost. And given that the Lord Jesus promised he would return in glory to bring the kingdom of God to the whole human race, we may well wonder, where is he? Why is he taking so long to come again? But these very same questions were asked during the first months and years just after Christ's resurrection and ascension. And so from the beginning, the church has been deeply puzzled over the timing of the last day. Why does he delay? That is why St. James addressed these uncertainties in his New Testament letter, from which our second lesson is taken today. Be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and late rains. You too must be patient. Make your hearts firm because the coming of the Lord is at hand. And yet here we are two millennia later, still waiting, not always so patiently, for the coming of the Lord. Part of the problem in our perception of the supposed delay of Christ's return is how we experience time, which is a dimension of the created universe by which the Creator is not bound. For example, by our best educated guess, the cosmos seems to be about 13.7 billion years old, give or take 200 million years, and our Milky Way galaxy is nearly the same age as the rest of the universe at 13.6 billion years. But our sun is a youngster at only 4.6 billion years of age, while this earth is a mere stripling at 4.5 billion years. So the universe is roughly three times the age of our planet and the earth went for more than four billion years without any animal life on dry land. It seems that animals began to appear out of our oceans only about 430 million years ago. And then the dinosaurs arrived about 200 million years later. They flourished for over 180 million years until one day all the dinosaurs died in a cataclysm 66 million years ago. Friends, this whole universe in all its glorious complexity was brought into being by God from nothing. And from the beginning, the development of the cosmos has been directed by an eternal purpose through the constant creative act of the divine word of God, the Logos, by whom and for whom all things were made, including time itself. At God's good pleasure, our species seems to have appeared in Africa a few hundred thousand years ago, although the archaeological record of bones and tools is bewildering in its complexity and ambiguity. What we can say with relative confidence is that Homo sapiens began living in communities outside of Africa about 70,000 years ago and the oldest surviving human artifacts known to us are just about 40,000 years old. Then cities began to appear about 10,000 years ago, while the oldest known written languages were composed around 5,000 years ago. So, it took 13.7 billion years to go from the creation of the universe to the creation of written language which means that if the history of the universe were condensed to a scale of 24 hours, human civilization would have been here for less than a second. And the faith of Jews and Christians would have existed for an impossibly tiny fraction of one second too small to imagine. And yet, despite this extraordinary timeline, we dare to be impatient for Christ to come back and conclude the story of man's existence and salvation. 
One remedy for our impatience is to look at salvation history in the context of both geological history and all of cosmic history. Perhaps then we can understand that even after 2,000 years of Christianity, we may still be in the very earliest hours of the church's history. Or maybe not. We cannot know. And we will not know until the risen Lord Jesus returns in glory to judge the living and the dead and bring the full and final consummation of the kingdom of God to all the tribes of the earth. And so, once again, we must learn from the wisdom of St. James. Be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Make your hearts firm, because the coming of the Lord is at hand. Even if that final return is eons in the future. But while we wait patiently for the coming of the Lord in glory on the last day, we must also remember that he is already here, right now. At his ascension to God the Father, the risen Christ promised to remain with us always. And by the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus fulfills that promise in several ways. In the church, which is his body, Christ is present whenever Christians gather to pray in his name. The Lord Jesus is present in the poor, the sick, the imprisoned, and the immigrants whom we serve in his name. The Savior is also present in the God-breathed scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, which are human words speaking the divine word. And the Messiah is present in the seven sacraments of the new and everlasting covenant, above all in the Holy Eucharist, in which we adore the same risen Christ now worshipped by the saints and angels in glory. In the most blessed sacrament of the altar, we now have communion with the risen Lord Jesus of the most immediate and intimate kind. And the Holy Eucharist is food for the journey that will sustain the church's watchful patient until the end of days, no matter when that should come. But if most people are unaware of the presence of the Word made flesh among us now in all those ways, remember that nearly everyone was unaware of his first coming among us as a helpless child, the babe of Bethlehem. And even during the three years of Christ's public ministry, most people could not believe that the Son of Mary was truly God the Son, the eternal Word by whom all things were made. That is why John the Baptist, from his prison cell, directed his disciples to seek out the Lord Jesus, whom John had already acclaimed at the River Jordan to be the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. John, of course, had known from his womb that his kinsman Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus, in turn, knew that John was his forerunner, the messenger sent to announce the coming of the Lord, the last prophet of the Old Covenant and the first prophet of the New. But now the end of John's life was approaching and it was time for him to decrease so that the Lord whom he served would increase, increase in the understanding of all those who seek to know, love, and serve the living God and to worship him in spirit and truth. So, John sent his disciples to Jesus with this question, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? Jesus said to them in reply, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind regain their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised and the poor have the good news proclaimed to them. Those were the signs which bore witness to the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. But with the death of the last apostle, those signs went over into the sacraments. Now the church herself and the seven sacraments are the signs that the Savior is here with us to give the life of grace to all who welcome him with faith, hope, and love. In Christ's church, 
The marks of the messianic age are made visible when we live the life of the new creation, primarily by the way in which we treat other people and serve them as we would serve Christ himself. The prophet Isaiah describes this life of grace in today's first lesson. Strengthen the hands that are feeble. Make firm the knees that are weak. Say to those whose hearts are frightened, be strong, fear not. Here is your God. He comes with vindication. With divine recompense, he comes to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf be cleared, then will the lame leap like a stag, then the tongue of the mute will sing. So, when will the Lord return in glory? That we cannot know. But we do know that he is already here. And when we see Christ, by grace through faith, in all the ways he dwells among us now, then Isaiah's vision is fulfilled in the church. Those whom the Lord has ransomed will return and enter Zion singing, crowned with everlasting joy. They will see with joy and gladness. Sorrow and mourning will flee. And my friends, here we are, just as Isaiah foretold, singing with joy the praises of Emmanuel, God with us. So is Jesus the one who is to come? Yes, he is. The Lord Jesus is the word made flesh who first came to us as a child to suffer and die and rise to new life. The same Messiah now comes in word and sacrament to make us holy by uniting us to himself. And the Lamb once slain who lives forever will come in glory to make all things new on the last day, a day for which we watch patiently, even as we pray eagerly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.